Whoa, whoa, whoa. C Sharp in the browser? That's crazy, right? Not with Blazor. In this episode, I'll show you all about it. Hey, welcome to episode 30 of Code Hour. This is going to be a fun one. I've been fiddling around with a new technology called Blazor WebAssembly that I want to share with you. And uh, this technology was released mm, two months ago in May of 2020, but it's been around for a lot longer than that. And what it does is it allows you to write C Sharp and it compiles it down into WebAssembly that then can be run natively in web browsers. What is WebAssembly? Well, that is this really cool new technology that all of the browsers have come out with that is basically a bunch of low-level instructions that, uh, like bytecode, that you can compile various languages down into and sort of skip JavaScript. And uh, that actually gives you more flexibility if you skip the JavaScript layer because there's more bytecode instructions in WebAssembly than JavaScript gives you access to. And so WebAssembly applications can actually be faster than JavaScript applications. And so that's amazing. And so there's a lot of different technologies that target WebAssembly, but Blazor is one of them, and it's the coolest one because it allows you to write in C Sharp. But it does more than that, and I'm going to get in this episode into all of the benefits that it gives you, but one of them is it gives you components, which is the like information hiding, so you can write modular little bits and pieces and compose applications. Uh, it gives you data binding syntax. It gives you Razor. You can write um, your views in Razor, which is this sort of pleasant hybrid of HTML and C Sharp. It's, it's really nice. I'll show that. And it gives you interop, so you can communicate with JavaScript, have JavaScript call into WebAssembly, and then it also gives you dependency injection. Uh, testability is a first-class citizen in Blazor. I love that, just like in Angular. And uh, oh, oh, and validation, uh, and a variety of other things that I'll get into. So without further ado, oh, well, what am I going to do? So I was thinking that I, when I was teaching this to myself, I thought I would like to build a like a little game that I could help teach my daughter how to type. And so this was a game that I played a long time ago. Um, my wife and I used to actually have little competitions to see who could type faster using this game called Typer Shark. And so I thought I'd recreate it for a modern world that runs in the browser and that is a multiplayer. And uh, that is one of the another sort of huge hidden benefit to Blazor is that you can have the same component be able to be run either server side or client side based on a runtime decision. So there's a core engine to this game, and so the game well the game is called Typer Shark, um, and you can here it is you can play either single player or you can play multiplayer. And if you play single player like this, then it, this is all working. Um, it's all working 100% um, in the browser. So you could turn off your internet connection and this would still work. And that's cool, right? But in order to play a multiplayer, you have to be able to interact with other people. So it, this would have to run on the server side. And so there's a core engine here, which is it's taking, it's generating sharks. And, as, and, and the, for each shark, there's like a timer that like times out and it keeps track of all the different players and who's typed what and which element of each shark has been typed and then if the shark has been typed then it gets killed and it tells everybody to remove their sharks and so there's this this engine it's not super complicated but it's not super simple but i never gave any consideration at all to whether this was going to be running server side or or client side and it just works client side with blazor and based on whether you click this button or whether you click this button that core set of code is then either running in the browser or it's running up on the server and it's communicating back with all its clients using SignalR. And that's super cool and I'll get into the details of that probably in another episode. Too much for a short little 30 minute episode. But for this episode I want to go over the Blazor basics and then I wanted to build out this game which is way too much but I'll just pull in code and show you the cool bits and pieces as I'm building out. Sound good? All right, let's get started. So I'm going to open up Visual Studio. To get this working, you need a latest version of Visual Studio. And so I'm going to create a new project. And you will only get this dialog if you have the latest version. 
So I'm going to create a new Blazor app, and we'll call it Typer Shark Demo. Okay, so first question is saying, do you want this Blazor to run be Blazor server side or Blazor WebAssembly? The answer, uh, it depends, I guess. I'm going to show Blazor WebAssembly because that's the cool new technology. The Blazor server side is when Blazor is going to, the, the code is almost identical. Like you're writing exactly the same same code, but Blazor server side will actually run server side and it will send little HTML snippets down to all of its clients and tell them what to render and how to render. It's sort of like update panels were back in um, back in the web forms days. Uh, but that limits scalability because then your server needs to keep track of all your clients who are connected and there's no offline capability. So I'm going to do Blazor WebAssembly. There's a couple questions here. Do you want to configure it for HTTPS? Yeah, yeah sure, whatever. Uh, ASP.NET Core hosted. I do want to, this will generate a whole additional project for you which will then host your Blazor component because otherwise you'd have to um, compile it and find some place to to host it, some server to serve it. So this is nice. I like this. This gives you a lot of convenience. The progressive web application is saying, would you like us to generate a little config file that allows people to install this application natively as if it's an application? I'm sure we can do that. That's cool. It doesn't matter. Okay, and here we are right out of the box with a application that has given us three different projects. The client is the Blazor itself. The server is an ASP.NET Core application which will be hosting the client. And then this is a shared component where if you have any code that is going to be shared between both of those projects, you can put that in there. And if I were to just start this up from scratch, uh, server is what you have the startup project be. And if I were to hit F5, Whew, there we are. Okay, that took a while. Um, you can notice that little install button. That was because we checked the progressive uh, web app button. And so there's like a little counter here. This is the demo that everybody always shows. It's like, ooh, there's a counter. Way very exciting. But if I hit F12 and um, take a look into the sources, you can see that we have actually downloaded. We've actually downloaded like, these web assembly bits and pieces. So this is all running uh, client side. And that's kind of cool, but I'm going to delete all of this. And um, oh, and this is pulling data from the server. Yay! Very exciting. Uh, I'm going to delete all of this and start from scratch. Okay. So in the client, let me just give a quick overview of some of the code here. So if you take a look at program.cs, you're going to see that this is where you can add dependency injection. So this is saying. Well, here, this is saying I want to add an HTTP client. So if anyone ever requests an HTTP client, give them this one. So that's where that this code, it's weird. It looks like it's ASP.NET Core startup project, but it's, it's actually Blazor. And this happens the very first time the application starts, not any time any client requests it. There's a layout page here with a nav menu. I don't want any of that. I'm just going to get rid of all of this and just put in a body. Okay, in www.root here, you'll notice there's an index HTML. That is the main page uh, that you can um, add JavaScript files to, uh, CSS files to if you need to. I'll be doing that in a little bit. But let's see if I can just get a, a blank app where up and working. And inside of pages, pages and components are kind of the same thing. And there's an index. That's the main one that's going to load for the very first time. And this is because it has a page directive here. That's saying that if any, if the route matches what's in that page directive, then it'll load that. Okay, so I've got a real simple page here which is going to show do you want to play single player or do you want to play multiplayer? And let's run this. I'm going to hit F5 and see if this works. Okay, well, I got my styling wrong. I need to fiddle with that. But uh, we did at least get a single player and a multiplayer and a let me add them button. And when I clicked that let me add them button, it tried to navigate to slash game. 
and said, sorry, there's nothing at this address. So in order to fix that, this href here, we need to have a game page. So let me show you about uh, navigation and the way that works. So creating a new component or a new page, uh, they're kind of the same thing, it involves, uh, well, you could say file new item. There it is, razor component. And we'll call this a game. And so they want what they want you to do by default, the, the way the tooling works right now is they want you to put all this code into a code block, which I find really objectionable. This would be like a public void do it. I really like to have my code and my views separated in separate files, but to do that, it's non-intuitive. The correct way, the way to do that anyway, is you have to add a new page, a new class, and make it have the exact same name as the razor page. So this will be called game, and we can make this partial, and now it is happy. And so I'm going to do the same thing. I'll show the let's let's just see if this worked. So I should be able to go to a, a game page now. <laughs> okay, I gotta fix that styling. But that button there. Oh, it didn't work because in the game page I forgot to say at page. Okay, there we go. Type sharp game. Okay, great. I'm gonna fix that styling real quick. Okay, there we go. Uh, I just threw in a uh, container fluid. Forgot that to put that in the main layout. Okay, I think it's time to talk a little bit more, a, a, bit, a bit more about components. So I think what we what I would like to do here anyway is when we have someone click select multiplayer, this is be a button that we'll add right here. I want to have it hide the current stuff on the page. I don't want to navigate, I just wanted to have it kind of happen inline. And then I'll have another component reappear in its place that says, hey, what's your name? So to do that, I'm going to uncomment back this button and it says on click, we have an event here, and so I'll have like a variable which will trigger whether or not to show that other component. And to do that, we need some code behind, so I'm going to do the same trick I did last time. Okay, I've got code from last time, and now I'm going to create an event handler for this on click event for this button. So notice this razor syntax. If you're not familiar with this, it's kind of, the, I don't know, it's kind of an intuitive mix between C Sharp and HTML. Um, like, I was just thinking, oh, I should be able to just put in what's your name, but it thinks I'm still in C Sharp mode. Notice you have to put these uh, at symbols in to indicate that you're in C Sharp, and uh, in this case, I think if you put in some HTML, if I put in like a P, which is what I really ought to have done, if I was saying what's your name, then it will know that I should go back to HTML. Hey, look at that, it worked. Okay, so the thing is that we want this really to be a separate component. So I'm gonna create, uh, so, uh, you know, let me see this, I can sort of keep this index page a little tight and I don't want it just like sprawling. And so, and, and that also allows me to show how you can pass data into components and pull data back out of components, which is gonna be a really important part of organizing your code nicely inside of a larger Blazor component world. And it sort of shows you the way these things work. So um, I should probably have another one called components. Um, pages, I don't know, it's, again, pages and components are kind of the same thing. The only difference is whether you have this at page um, directive up here, but for organization, I don't know, it seems a little tidier to have another one called components. I haven't noticed a lot of other people adding the word component onto their end of their components in Blazor, but coming from an Angular world, it just makes sense to me, and so that's what I'm gonna do, and hopefully it'll be a little, little bit easier for you to follow.
All right, and it's time to try to include this component, which turns out to be really easy, generally. If it's in the same namespace, it's really easy. If it's in a different namespace, like the way I just did it, it's going to be a little bit harder, but not much. You basically just say add player component, and it'll generally figure out what you're trying to do. In this case, though, we do need to add the namespace uh, type of shark demo dot clients dot components and I could add it just here but I think it would be nicer to do it across the entire application so all components are available everywhere and the right place to do that is somewhere I think in shared is it imports no it's imports here we go and that should just work now oh hey look the squiggles disappeared that's a good sign all right I'm gonna recompile this Great, it worked, very good. So I'm going to code this up just a little bit, this component, so that it tries to uh, actually, well, it looks halfway decent and it has a button and sends that information back out to the parent who can then save it. Okay, and here we are. We've got uh, uh, an edit form. So what is an edit form, you might be asking. Oh, let's get rid of this. Oh, no, the label's right. So an edit form is like a smart form. It's a, it gives you a lot more capabilities when you're in this Blazor world for doing CRUD type of work. It gives you validation, which I'll show in a little bit, but it also gives you the ability to have strongly typed components. So when I say my model is a temp player that says this edit form is for editing the value called temp player which is a just a thing that I put here back uh, in the code behind which is of type player DTO which has a name and maybe it could have more fields but for now it just has a name and then then that allows you to do things like an input text so you probably were expecting me to do, if you're used to HTML, you're probably expecting an input type equals text, but if you use this server-side control called an input text, then it will give you a strongly typed ability to, to bind to the values in here, and, and in particular, when I say at bind dash value, This is some of the weirdness in Blazor. Uh, sometimes when you get errors, they just pop up in these random code generated files, add player component .cs. I guess this is getting generated whenever there's an error in your, well, actually whenever Razor probably gets compiled, and generally it's getting compiled down to these C sharp files. And um, so sometimes when there's com compiler errors, then they'll show up in here, which is weird. And um, generally the, the tooling is just not quite there yet. So, I mean, the fact that I'm seeing this at all, it would have been really nice if it just told me what the error was, and I'm gonna have to muddle this out. Oh, there we go, that compiles. It looks like I needed to put another at symbol in there. Or maybe I didn't even need the at. Okay, so hopefully this is, uh, this is going to just automatically do a two-way data binding. And I haven't even shown you one-way data binding yet, but um, in fact, maybe I will here, just so that you can believe me that there is this, oh, that's, it's, uh, see, I keep going into Angular thinking, oh, I can just do that. No, no, no. There, and so that's gonna, that's gonna do the one-way data binding, and this is going to do the two-way data binding. And so let's, let's see if this works. I wish the autocomplete wouldn't be there so you could see it a little bit better, but basically whenever I mouse out, that is when it gets its new value. There we go, I don't even need to hit the button. So that is data binding, and it is one of the really nice features of Blazor that you're getting in there. And so now let's take this temp player name, and once they hit the OK button, then we want to have it uh, send that value back into the parent. And to do that, the parent is going to have to send in an event.
Actually, let's do before we even do that. Let's let's just uh, do a little console logging. So, uh, and I like being able to do this now because it's going to show you how the way dependency injection works. So, dependency injection is as simple as saying I want you to inject something. It would be nice if constructor injection worked inside of the Blazor components, but it does not. But if you write any services, it will constructor injection will work there. It's just depending on which context you're in, you have to do a different technique. So the at inject thing will work here, and so we can say a public. Yeah, so we want an iLogger of type add player component. Okay, so yeah, I added this inject iLogger, and then I just logged to it, and we should see that work happen in the console once they click the button. So. Player name is okay, so that was dependency injection. You'll notice that everything inside of Blazor is all async friendly, which is which is really nice. So you will never need to do a, a async voids anywhere. You can always make them async task, and should. Okay, so when we're setting the player name, it should try to invoke this, but we never actually passed it. So we need inside of the index page to go back here and pass a uh, parameter for that. And so that's going to be called on player added equals. Okay, if this works, we should see player added from index once we uh, add a player. Nope, I screwed something up. Cannot provide a value for property logger um, on index. Oh, oh, I should have made that an iLogger. Yes, of course I should have. And look at that. Player added from index. All right, I wasn't sure if that was going to work. Okay, let's. Um, I don't know. Should we talk validation? Is it time to do a little validation? Because this is bad. Like if I do this and I say mm okay, then uh, player added from index with nothing. And really, we want people to have player names. That's important. So uh, this is one of the really nice things about Blazor. They make validation really easy. So all you have to do is just add a validation summary and it will automatically pick up your annotations. So we have said in the add player component here that well, we're using this edit form and we've said that the model is a temp player and a temp player is of type player DTO and all I have to do here is add some annotations like required. Oh, I think I need to add a NuGet dependency to uh, uh, data annotation components or whatever. By the way, I'm putting my models inside of the shared thing here because in when I build this project for real, um, all of these things needed to be shared. Sometimes they were run server side, sometimes they were run client side. Often I have the server side sending validation or data back uh, via um, signal R back to the client, or sometimes I just had it run natively. So all of the details definitely need to be here, along with the player and the game engine. Anyway, we've said it's required, and I think, you, I don't know, is that enough? Or maybe I could put in a max length. Okay, and then I think we need to tell it to do validation. It won't do it by default. So we can put in a validation summary, I think, and I'll have to look it up. I, I wish the IntelliSense was better. For me, I cannot get, like, I should be able to say validation and have it automatically type complete that. So the tooling definitely has a long way to go in, in Blazor WebAssembly. This is definitely a new technology. It's kind of raw, but I'm, I'm sure by the time you're fiddling around with this, this won't be a problem. It's just a problem for because uh, it's early days. I mean, it's only two month old technology, really. Hey, look at that. That worked. <laughs> All right, and uh, the name is required, and I bet that if I type in a long name, hey, the name field must be um, an array type with a maximum length of 20. An array type? 
Uh, it's not the world's most friendly error message, but you can go back into the data validation, I think, and say that I would like an, a better error message. There we go. Okay, so you can do custom validation. So that's that's great. And we're sending the data back. Are there any other... Oh, interop. I really ought to show interop before I close out this episode. And so I'm just going to do a bunch of coding to try and get it to the point where I can show that and it'll be interesting. And uh, definitely not going to finish building out this game, but if you are interested in the source code, I'll uh, provide a link in the in the show notes to, it's all open source, it's all on uh, my uh, El Prichar uh, GitHub repository, um, but I'll show that later. Let's just do a little bit interop, and that'll be, that'll be fun. Okay. Okay, just a whole bunch of um, importing of code and all kinds of things are going to go wrong and it'll be interesting to try and sort it out. But the one thing I did not import was the, the JavaScript interop, which you, you need to, when you type buttons on the, um, you know, when you <laughs> type buttons, when you, when you press keys on the keyboard, uh, it should, uh, JavaScript, uh, there's a JavaScript event you can tie into that it will uh, find those, but there's no Blazor event that you can tie into that can listen to these, at least not currently. And so as you're typing keys, JavaScript needs to be able to call into Blazor code. And so I just wanted to show just a little bit of interop to get a sense of how that, that worked. So ignore all of this code that I just imported. We're going to um, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll get to the point where I hit start, start single player game and sharks will start going across the page. Um, I think one thing I need to do that is to import the CSS file. So I'm going to import the CSS file. Again, I showed the index.html in the www root folder here earlier. And uh, that's where I would just need to import that CSS file. And I think then I'm going to be able to run this and it's going to be a complete disaster. And it should be very exciting. You think, you think I've learned, <laughs> you think I've learned how um, to import a CSS file by now. Oh, cannot, cannot provide a value for property context on type player dot game. Uh, there is no registered service of type uh, I game context. Ah, true, true, true. And I never really got to show the way dependency injection works. I kind of mentioned it in passing, but uh, one of the things that I said when I created this game com context here, game, not the game context, the game CS file here, as I said, please give me an iGame context, which is the sort of a generalized thing that keeps track of the player name and whether you're playing in multiplayer mode and um, you know how many sharks there are and uh, various other things. So that iGame context, we need to register that and I will register that as I think a singleton, I can't really remember, but uh, builder, the way you do that is you go into program.cs and you say builder.services.add singleton, I think. Wow. Okay. That's surprising. Hey, and look, sharks are flying across the page. So that's cool. This is all just happening with CSS. There's nothing, um, this is all just uh, CSS. There, there's nothing fancy going on here. F-A-C-T. Um, in fact, I think if you take a look into the CSS, shark swimming, um, and then there's like, yeah, these little animation timing functions. I'd like it to be um, linear and there's some keyframes and blah blah blah. No, nothing, nothing fancy going on there. Just a little, little CSS which makes them animate. Okay, uh, but we can't we can't actually do anything with it. It's it's a it's a not a very exciting game if you're just watching sharks swim across the page and you can't do anything with them. So we need to get into JavaScript. And so to do that, uh, in the index HTML, I'm going to add a reference to a JavaScript file. And well, I guess maybe I should add a JavaScript file first. So.
Okay, so we've added a reference to interrupt.js and inside of, so it's, it's gonna, not, nothing crazy here, just adding a reference to a file and in here I could do like an alert hi just to see if this works. Okay, hi, great. Okay, I think what this will do is whenever you press a key, it'll just pop up a, an alert with that key. Uh, okay, something like that. There we go. Okay, that's great. Uh, now we just need to call into .NET, and that happens with an object which .NET puts on the window object, so it's available everywhere, which is called .NET and you can do dot net dot okay and so it takes two parameters I have to double check this but it takes two parameters one is the name of the uh, assembly I think so this would be called typer shark demo dot client and then the name of um, it, the name of a method that we're going to expose I'll show that okay right so we need well, it's called JS on key press. And uh, then we need uh, to expose that. So it's, so okay, so we're gonna put that into a folder called interop and a class called interop or whatever. And then there's this attribute called JS invocable, which is saying, I want this static method to be available to JavaScript. And to do that, you do um, JS invocable public void and then uh, make it uh, an event available which someone could subscribe to in C Sharp, which would be like... Uh okay, and I'm gonna try, um, I'm just gonna try setting a breakpoint here. I haven't actually shown this yet, but breakpoints are uh, do work and they work really nicely. So yeah, this might work. Um, all right, so yeah, we said this is JS invocable. It's called JS on key press, and here we said to invoke JS on key press. Yeah, let's see what happens. Okay, that took a really long time to load. Let me add him. And I'm gonna hit a button. Oh my gosh. It actually worked. <laughs> I hit the T button. Yes, I did. All right, we got interop working. My friends, this is exciting. All right. So, um, last thing we need to do, just uh, hook this event handler up. So to do that, we go back to game, probably in the constructor, or on initialized async. I didn't talk about lifecycle methods much, but there's an on initialized async that you can override, and that's uh, a key lifecycle event, and there's also a disposed, and that works fine. So I'm gonna say interop. I'm going to hook that up into the on key press that I copied over. And uh, every time you subscribe from an event, you should unsubscribe from an event. Oh, I didn't mention this, by the way, but this state has changed. This is saying normally the data binding works just automatically. And basically, I think what's happening is anytime there's an event uh, that happens, a button that's clicked or whatever at the end of it, Blazor is automatically calling state has changed for you, which is like synchronizing everything up. It looks for, I think there's got probably a virtual DOM and it's uh, taking a look inside of the virtual DOM and the actual DOM and seeing if they match up. And if they don't, then it'll copy the things over into the actual DOM that need to occur. It does that for performance reasons. And sometimes if you're doing things like interop, then it does not know that the state has changed. And so you need to manually call this method state has changed to tell it, hey, go sync everything up. Oh, and I didn't talk about parameters either, but um, this is a parameter method here. If you put this attribute on and it'll go look inside of, uh, in this case, um, I said you can alternatively get to this from game, but you can alternatively get to this from game slash squiggle game ID. And so if you pass in, if you do in the URL, if you're like slash game slash five, then it'll parse that out and put it into this string. It'd be nice if you could tell it was an integer, but you can't right now. I'm sure they'll fix that at some point in the future. So I have to manually parse that into an int in this like get game ID, whatever. 
but I'm losing my context. Well, all right, I was just trying to unsubscribe. No big deal. I think I think we're done. This should just work. I'm gonna hit F12 and everything's just going to magically work and um, I will be able to start solving sharks, right? Okay, all right, let me add them. I'm gonna start a game. P, oh, I still got my breakpoint. Oh, it worked, it worked, uh, go away. Oh, no, wait, okay, okay, hang on. Yay, all right. Yay, the game's working. How cool is that? All right, so this was a fun episode for me anyway. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I have shown what Blazor is. I've shown about components, uh, data binding syntax, validation. I've shown a little bit of interop. I've shown how you can pull down things from NuGet, and um, they work directly in Blazor, and you're all doing C Sharp in client side on the browser, how cool is that? If you enjoy this episode, uh, as usual, like, subscribe, there's all that, but um, also let me know in the comments if you'd like more about this particular content, uh, uh, about this particular topic. For instance, I would uh, be, I would love to show you the part of it where it's communicating with the server and how I got that game engine to work both server side and client side. If you comment and tell me that you want that, I will do that. Otherwise, I'll probably get back more into ASP.NET boilerplate types of things. Okay, so thanks. Have a wonderful uh, day and week and whatever. All right. <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye.